is now uh, the time, one o'clock in the UK. So I'd like to welcome all of you to this LTC COVID webinar on safe visiting in nursing homes, looking at the experience of different countries, an extremely timely and important topic. And I'm very grateful to particularly uh, Lee Fellow for organizing this, for also uh, leading on putting together an excellent report for LTC COVID. If you haven't seen it, uh, we will be sharing the link um, at some point in the chat box. And I really, really recommend that you have a look. So uh, thank you very much, Li Fei. Um, right just at the end, I will be also announcing the next webinar. But uh, for now, the floor is all yours. Those of you who are not speaking, please uh, mute yourselves. And also just a reminder that this is being recorded. We will be sharing a video and the slides at the LTC COVID website. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for coming. Um, as is Australian practice, I'd like to start by actually acknowledging to the traditional custodians of the land in which we all meet, which for me um, are the First Nations, uh, are the Karagal people of the Eora Nation and, and the traditional owners of the lands where you all are, um, and elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to thank you for coming and, for, uh, and especially like to thank all my colleagues who contributed to this paper. It really was an international and collaborative effort. And what's gonna happen today is um, we're gonna have uh, uh, speakers from a range of different countries share their experiences of safe visiting and what's happened in their countries and uh, some aspects of, of that we've touched on in the report and then I'll share the overall recommendations at the end. Um, so it's midnight here in Australia and I'd like to invite my colleague uh, Dr. Joyce Siet, who's a research fellow at Macquarie University um, here in Sydney to kick off. Please go ahead, Joyce. Great, thanks, Lefo. I'm just going to share the <clears throat> screen over there. So can we all see that? Yeah, fabulous. Okay, so hello, I'm Dr. Joyce Siet. I'm a research fellow at Macquarie University, and today I'll be presenting the Australian perspective on the paper. So just to give you a bit of an overview, we all know that the first case was reported um, in the 31st of December, but I thought it'd be good to give an Australian um, side of things just to show what happened. On the 25th of January, we had our first Australian case that was being reported. And then our prime minister, and quite late in February, uh, declared and activated a emergency response plan. On the 1st of March, the first Australian death was reported from COVID. <clears throat> And to mid to late March, we then introduced these slow the spread measures, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with. So with physical distancing, restrictions on outdoor gatherings and so forth. And at that time, we had reached about 440 cases. Also, in around March at the time, the federal government um, issued some directives that had restricted visitors to care homes. So this now limited visits um, for the visitors to one visit a day, maximum of two visitors, Visits had to take place in residence rooms or in outdoor areas, had to be kept brief. Visitors could not, um, age under 16, were discouraged to attend. And you couldn't visit if you have any flu symptoms or if you hadn't had the latest flu shot. So in early April, we had reached our peak at about 6,700 cases of our first wave and cases began to fall, which was a good sign. Then the government issued a three-stage plan where we start to begin easing lockdown restrictions across 8th of May. And these restrictions across the care homes were still allowed, but they were, um, they were still restricted. A second wave came around on the 20th of June as Victoria entered a new wave um, <clears throat> in Australia. And so just to give you a bit of perspective, it's about 7,800 cases. We had some blanket bans reinstated then. But in August, they declared, um, the Victorians declared a state of disaster. We now had nightly curfews. Uh, there was mandatory face coverings across Melbourne. And then there were also restrictions. They closed the borders down um, entering Victoria. So in August, we had 22,000 cases. And in the 19th of October, so across probably a three, four month period, we finally had the rest restrictions eased across Victoria. Um, and it was further eased as the numbers dwindled. 26th of October, Victoria had no zero new cases, which was a really great news. 
1st of November, Australia had zero new locally acquired cases. But then across November and just before Christmas, we had some small outbreaks um, in South Australia, in Sydney, Northern Beaches. But these were really quickly controlled and the restrictions ended um, fairly quickly. <clears throat> so I just want to end with that there are about 28,000 on the 31st of December. I don't know what it is now, but the numbers are quite low. The Australian government also issued some mental health support for aged care residents at the end of October, recognising the need for them to have psychological support and gave them free visitations up to 2022 for, I think, 20 psychological visits. So what is happening now with the facilities? Aged care facilities now permit um, gatherings of residents in communal or outdoor areas, but they've postponed any large excursions or large group outings. They allow residents to leave the family if it's a small gathering now. And as throughout COVID, they helped the residents to stay connected with families and friends. It's great to hear that now spouses, relatives and social supports, including children of any age can visit, and there is no limit to the number of hours they can spend now with their spouse or their relative. So our co-author, um, Rioni, isn't here today, but I'd like to present a case study of what she has presented in our paper. As to recap, on the 18th of March, this was when the national government um, issued the directive that restricted visitors to the care homes. And she received a letter on the 27th of March from her facility um, where her mum was staying and said that from this time, no visitors will be allowed to enter any home except in exceptional circumstances. She was a family member, but she couldn't visit her mum at all. And the letter also stated that over the week, it has become apparent that our initial partial restrictions are not managing the risk of infection spread and so forth. And so therefore they had implemented this on their own, um, a lot more stringent restrictions. Finally, after three months of restriction, she was able to visit her mum. And she said her mum was really glad to see her and it was good to visit every day for a fortnight before restrictions happened again afterwards. <clears throat> So I want to briefly touch upon the impact because I'm sure many of our other co-authors and colleagues will be talking about this. Um, so pre-COVID, people in care homes commonly had symptoms of depression and loneliness. Uh, residents would often have cognitive impairment um, of some sort. So we may argue that residents might have less cognitive capacity and perhaps psychological resilience to comprehend or cope with COVID changes, including the fear of COVID infection um, and also experiencing negative mental health impacts. Whilst care homes have limited access to technology and have tried to pick this up, residents do have varying comfort with using technology. And it means that for many residents, compensation using technology for the needed socialization was not possible or effective. So I gave you a brief overview about the states and territories have own issued their public health directions, which have impacted the visitors to aged care homes and generally speaking, these are about limiting care and support visits to one per day. And sometimes the restrictions um, uh, have, have you know, banned visits altogether. Providers have also elected to impose even stricter restrictions on visitation rights to halt the spread of um, COVID. But I like to note that while many residents of aged care homes in Australia have not experienced a COVID outbreak at their facility, they have endured restrictions for most of this year that go beyond those endured by the general community or those by older adults. And as a consequence, many of them have not been able to spend time with their loved ones in a meaningful and fulfilling way. Here are some quotes from a national survey that I conducted during the first wave of Australia. And we have some residents' voices, which told us that the virus has really stopped them from living normally, that they have been isolated and they have, can't remember ever being so isolated. <clears throat> so there have been attempts by both the aged care sector and the Australian Department to improve this situation, but these attempts, we argue, have been inadequate, partly because of a lack of funding for additional staff to facilitate the visits by conducting screening, assisting with PPE, and where necessary, accompanying visitors. The reduction in visitors also means that staff time is stretched, just trying to meet the day-to-day -day needs of the residents. And some providers, whilst they've increased staff numbers, to meet these needs, but many providers, according to the evidence of other union surveys, have actually reduced staff numbers. Maintaining quality of life um, of residents throughout the pandemic is just as important as preparing for and responding to these outbreaks. Residents' entitlement to quality of life shouldn't change in an emergency, 
although how it can be achieved should. And if anything, I would say that quality of life becomes more important. But for many residents of aged care homes, the restrictions on these visits will have and continue to have serious consequences. So the importance of family, whether family and friends can visit aged care homes has been a contested issue since the first case um, happened in Australia. And this issue was addressed through the visitation code, which was developed and endorsed by peak organisations in Australia. And the latest version acknowledges the likelihood that protracted restrictions on visitations will have detrimental impacts on the well-being of residents. And it notes that the vital importance of the residents personal welfare and mental health in which the visitors play an important role. So my time is coming to an end and I'd just like to leave you with this image here. On one hand, we have these repeated visitor vans in response to tiny outbreaks um, compared to the rest of the world when there are very low levels of community transitions. We've had impact on the restrictions on families and residents and staff time and resources and providers. So what's, what's, what's our thoughts? Providers, I think, need to continually review and revise their position on visitation. They need to recognise the particular circumstances of their own facility and the level of community transmission in their location. Uh, aged care providers, Australian Department of Health, States and Territories must make an effort to encourage and facilitate safe visitation that complies with public health restrictions. But these visitations should be humane and proportionate to risk even during periods of community transmission. And in all but extreme cases, our perspective is that blanket bans on visitation are unacceptable and they should be both explained and justified. So thank you. I will take questions later. <laughs> Thanks, Joyce. Um, I forgot to say that we will be taking uh, questions directly after each talk, but if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We'll be monitoring it and we'll have uh, kind of an open panel discussion after all the speakers. Uh, so next we have um, Hilda Verbeek, who's Professor of Long Term, of the Long Term Care Environment at the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. Yes, welcome everybody. Thank you for inviting me. I will talk about the Netherlands allowing visitors back in nursing homes. And in this next seven minutes, I will briefly explain our first study and a recent study, uh, which we did on the national survey. So um, just to give you a little bit of insight in COVID-19 in the Netherlands, we have almost 1 million cases of COVID-19 in the Netherlands, and we have about 17 million people living in the Netherlands and about over uh, 14,000 uh, deaths. Here you see the COVID-19 in nursing homes. So we had the first wave was around March, April in the Netherlands and in nursing homes. Then it went down over summer. And uh, by the end of September, October, it went up again. And here it is November, December. So we're in a second or even a third wave. And at the moment, restrictions are really high in the Netherlands. So it's spread out everywhere again, curfew, uh, shops are closed, schools closed, etc. And um, at the moment, the most recent estimations indicate about 30,000 COVID-19 cases in nursing homes. So what our national government did was on March 20th, and in the southern part of the Netherlands even earlier, nursing homes were closed for visitors. So all visitors were banned. And this was a highly restrictive measure. So no family, friends, or volunteers were allowed. Only health services are highly necessary, for example, physiotherapy or occupational therapy. And creative alternatives were sought. So, for example, window visiting or these cubicles, which you see here, where is a glass interface where people could meet, but not directly have contact. And we also saw this was a serious challenge to residents' autonomy, and we didn't have any primary data on, OK, what does it mean for uh, visitors? So after two months of the ban, measures were um, in place to cautiously allow visits again. And there was a national pilot started in 26 nursing homes on May 11th. And uh, specific guidelines were developed by professional organizations like psychologists, nurses, client representative uh, organizations, for example, the Alzheimer's Society and the sector organization for nursing homes. And some of the key points were like, there is only one designated visitor allowed 
only planned visits, visits of maximum an hour, so you should register for it in advance. The organization should supervise these visits, so they walk you to the area where you can visit. We were not allowed to visit outside or go outside, and it was a little bit dependent on the local context, whether you could enter the nursing home or there was created a separate space, for example. And um, so we really investigated the impact on well-being. Okay, so we for after the first week and four weeks later, and all nursing homes of that pilot were uh, positive about the visit. So, for example, say say the real visits have a positive influence. Drinking a cup of coffee together, being in the same space without a screen, it seems small, but it feels like a giant emotional step. And um, also others say, well, staff members can never replace family members. And uh, since our res residents know that they're allowed to receive visitors again, there is a different mood and they have something to look forward to again. And um, based on this pilot and the results, we have um, highlighted them in another paper, uh, national guidelines were less restrictive. So for example, on June 15, um, you can have more than one designated visitors, for example. And as of July 1st, all nursing homes were open as usual. And that meant that everybody was allowed to visit, children, grandchildren, you were supposed to go outside, etc. And this was also in the period where there were less COVID infections in the Netherlands. And uh, then we thought, okay, what were the lessons that we learned? So we thought, well, it was way too restrictive for too long of a period of time. And um, we saw direct positive impact on residents by allowing visitors again. And we also saw reported cases from practice, for example, that people say, well, they de de deteriorated so quickly during this ban for visitors. Also family members reporting that and um, there were also discussions on why were nursing homes lagging behind, for example, on protective equipment like mouth masks. And there was really the debate, okay, the infection prevention versus the quality of life and what did we gain? This was the paper I was referring to in which this was uh, stated. And then we did a new survey following these 26 or 76 nursing homes, because we expanded a little bit, by the end of September, so early October. This was right, looking hindsight, right at the beginning of when COVID started again. And the question was, was daily life really back to normal? And did organizations feel prepared for a second wave of COVID-19? So we sent out a survey to the same uh, nursing homes which participated in the pilot and the second um, survey. We had a response of 83%, so 63 organizations responded, and uh, approximately 25% of these locations had COVID-19 infections. So maybe good for you to know uh, the other, uh, the 76 nursing homes in our first, so in May, none of these houses had COVID, so now a quarter of them had some COVID-19 infections. And these homes stated that over 90% has continued normal activity. So residents could participate in activities, they could go outside, leave the unit, receive care from physicians, etc. So that was all normal daily life. And the regular safety regulations were in place. So for example, no group activities and the usual or keeping the physical distance. Uh, we saw that 75% received the regular participation of volunteers again. Volunteers are also usually uh, more older persons, so 75% had them put back in place, for example, that they walked together with residents and did the normal activity again. And 65% on a two third had visitation as it was before COVID-19. So that meant that normal visitations were in place. So everybody could visit uh, for as long as you wanted. But almost one third had some guidelines ranging from you had to register as a visitor or only one visitor a day or only on your private room, for example, and not in communal spaces. So there was kind of like this local um, diversity. And maybe also good to know, the Dutch law had stipulated that uh, they would never put in a general national ban again because of the negative uh, consequences of it. What we saw was that there was really a stepped approach allowing visits. So one of the example, which we followed more in detail, a case study, they went in seven steps back to normal. So for example, first they allowed walking outside with one designated visitor. Then you could have two designated visitors only allowed in the afternoon. Then it was, or you could go with your family at home or outside the nursing home. They expanded to four designated visitors. Um, and on July 
4th, they said all visitors were welcome again without an appointment. And uh, by July 15th, they even opened up the restaurant again for the community. Just to give you an idea that putting in a ban in place and releasing it, it takes some time also because um, staff was really afraid of infection, getting infections back in, whereas we did not have any evidence that it is necessarily family members who bring it in, it could also be um, uh, staff bringing it in. Uh, the majority felt prepared for a second wave, so now the difference within March was now there was a sufficient PP, so protective equipment, also the available uh, local protocols, task capacity. And um, what we see is still the perceived stress by staff is really high, so there are high absence rates, for example, people have to go in quarantine of, uh, of themselves or of um, guests of their house. Some uh, staff had experienced long COVID, so they really had a uh, COVID experience themselves, but it takes up for months, um, the, the, the situation. And there is this real fragile balance between the fear of infection and the impact it has on the restrictions of well-being. So what we conclude is, well, there's not a national or general ban for visitors, and it's not ne necessary, maybe do more harm than good. Um, what we do see now is that there can be some local bans in place in an outbreak situation. For example, we have nursing homes having 80 more uh, residents uh, having a COVID-19 infection out of the 150, for example, living there. So we do see that on a local area, if there is really an outbreak of staff and residents having um, experiencing COVID, the whole nursing home closes. What we also see is that even uh, some nursing homes say, although we have COVID in the home or in the unit, visitors are still allowed. So there is quite a lot of spread now. And we think what's important is that residents should really have a voice and be heard. And it's about risk management, both the acute uh, versus the chronic threats for quality of life and residents in nursing homes should be weighted. And also really take close on the dignity at the end of life because that was really which was something stressful for staff that, for example, in one ward, many residents died at the same time without any family being there or and that really puts a lot of stress on everybody. That was in brief uh, the situation in the Netherlands. Thank you Hilda, um, for sharing that um, really great study and follow up. Um, next I'd like to welcome. Um, Dr. Samir Sinha, who's uh, the Director of Geriatrics at Sinai Health and at the University of Toronto. Welcome, Samir. Thank you very much, Lee Fei, and uh, thank you to everybody uh, joining us today. Uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about Canada's situation, and uh, I'm not going to uh, to use slides because uh, uh, trying to describe a, a federation uh, and how it's approached things um, has been rather interesting to document and to also look at. But a few things overall, just to contextualize things, Canada's performance overall uh, around the provision of long-term care uh, was really highlighted. It's one of its greatest weaknesses during this pandemic. So just over the weekend, we've now crossed 20,000 deaths that have occurred in our country. Doesn't sound like a big number for a country of 38 million people, but the more interesting uh, pieces or the poignant pieces are that 96% of our deaths have occurred amongst older people and 69% have actually occurred amongst those living in long-term care and what we would call retirement homes as well. So when we actually look at the number of homes across the country, we have about 5,801. Uh, the, the challenge with many of them is that many of them have not only experienced outbreaks, for example, about 40% of them, but many of them have experienced multiple outbreaks over the time. And to follow our trajectory during the pandemic, you know, like most countries, we experienced a significant first wave during the months of March um, through to, uh, to about June. Uh, and then we really classify the end of our first wave by the end of August. Uh, and July and August were fairly um, quiet months. Uh, here, things seem to be getting back to normal. And then we've really classified now our second wave as being one that really started you know, as of September uh, and peaked about a week or two ago uh, with new lockdown stay at home measures, depending on what province and territory you're in. And of course, within all of this, we've seen again, a significant amount of long-term care homes uh, affected, and especially those 
um, in provinces, uh, some of the larger provinces like Ontario. And Canada's responses have been variable because while we are, you know, while we do have a Canada Health Act, um, the, the provision of services, long-term care services and retirement home services really do, uh, um, are really governed at a provincial and territorial level. So in these cases, it's up to the provinces and territories, and we have 10 provinces and three territories that really make the rules and decide how they're going to govern services. And what we really saw during our first wave was that provinces and territories that acted early and definitively um, had much better outcomes and then other provinces that delayed on getting access, giving their homes access to personal protective equipment or taking other clear and definitive measures certainly had much worse outcomes. Uh, the, one of the challenges that we had, just like my colleagues have described, was really this ban on family visitor access that occurred very early on as one of the first definitive measures that happened in most provinces and territories by mid-March. And like other jurisdictions, we've had some really good data that has come out now uh, from various jurisdictions showing that this had significant um, uh, issues and impacts, uh, not only on, on, on residents themselves, but also family caregivers as well. So increased reports, for example, of you know, further functional decline, uh, increasing rates of loneliness, depression, and we use the interi uh, long-term care assessment in many of our provincial uh, territorial governments to actually assess on a quarterly basis the well-being of residents as well to develop care assessments. And that's where this sort of data, this concrete data has been coming from, really showing a decline uh, in resident well-being, for example. Other uh, studies that have come out more recently have shown a significant increase in the prescribing of antipsychotic medications, antidepressant medications, uh, and again, things that we can track to show that without family presence, this was creating additional issues. Because as my colleagues have described, uh, I think a lot of people didn't realize across Canada uh, how much family caregivers, if you will, were playing in the in the in the role of a home and the well-being of residents. And when you simply strip all of them away, for example, all of a sudden our understaffed homes have increasing staffing pressures because now there's all this extra work that was being done for free by family caregivers that's now transferred to the staff. And so certainly. Uh, uh, that only exacerbated matters worse and were creating increasing problems. It was only until uh, we started seeing uh, various uh, of these issues come to light that then various provinces and territories in a very piecemeal way started to try and address these issues. The first province out of the gate was Quebec, which had the most devastating first wave in Canada. Uh, over. Um, hundreds and hundreds of homes affected uh, the largest number of deaths, thousands of deaths that occurred in its homes, and really losing about 10,000 frontline workers who just quit and left the system. And so I cynically think that one of the reasons why in late May, they decided to welcome with open arms family caregivers into homes, including homes of outbreaks, was frankly with the premier of that province saying one day, well, frankly, you know, we know that they'll actually come in and help their loved ones and, and provide support. Um, over the months of June and July, we started seeing more measured actions happening um, in different provinces and territories to start looking at allowing outdoor visits, for example, but really limited on the basis of 30 minutes a week um, and really trying to encourage window visits and, and other measures. So in July, our National Institute on Aging, my colleagues, Dr. Nathan Stahl and, and, and myself, led the work of, of you know, compiling the evidence and, and, and many folks here on, on the call um, you know, participated in providing advice and guidance about what the Netherlands and other countries were doing. And that allowed us to actually create our own independent guidelines. The National Institute on Aging is not a federally funded um, agency, uh, but we were one that could actually come out with measured guidelines recognizing the difference between a family caregivers and general visits as well. And by putting together guidance and guidelines, we were happy to see that the provinces of Ontario, Prince Edward Island, fully adopted our guidance and started putting that into place. Um, and many other provinces started adapting their guidance over time. 
Finally, what we've actually seen, and again, to try and summarize this is a bit complicated, but what we started seeing was as that second wave started to come upon us, there were some provinces that continued to keep a, a more liberal level of guidance. For example, allowing family caregivers to still enter the homes um, during outbreaks, but certainly saying that they might cancel general visits. Other provinces certainly went more restrictive. Um, and so we had a lot of variable actions. And this is something that we have been tracking um, and keeping guidance around, but certainly our guidance um, that's been reflected in the international paper we participated in recently hasn't changed overall. We still believe that all the guidance we had is still supported by the evidence, but certainly we have been tracking how every province and territory has certainly been kind of modifying based on their local circumstances in terms of how much level, uh, what level of community spread and outbreak breaks are happening as well. So a real complicated picture, but one that we've been really proud to be part of a larger network um, uh, coordinated by LSC and, and really led internationally by Lee Fei on the caregiver front. Um, and we really appreciate the support of everybody so that we could help try and, and, and push forward uh, better evidence and good policy. What I will do is I will just leave a link um, to our July uh, report that we put out that kind of describes and shows a province by province breakdown about what was happening. And within the next uh, few days, we will be launching an updated guidance document. Doesn't change the guidance or recommendations that you'll see in the link that I just sent you, but really gives a good sense of how things have evolved over time in various provinces and territories. I'll stop there. Thanks, Samir, super interesting. Um, next, I'd like to invite um, Dr. Christian Bergman from Virginia Commonwealth University to tell us about what's been happening in America. Thank you all so much. Uh, <clears throat> Honored to be here today uh, with you all. And I know we are in like six different time zones around the world. So thank you all so much for uh, being present. So. Uh, put together a brief PowerPoint slides here, as Dr. Sinha had uh, indicated, this is more a lecture of health policy than science. Unfortunately, 2020 has been a challenging year worldwide, uh, particularly here in America also. And um, <clears throat> I will say that uh, just as a preference, um, before we talk here, uh, it has been more important to bridge connections between the health science community and policymakers than it has to uh, apply for a grant or study something. Unfortunately, the research has been moving too slow to be able to guide um, policies that seem to shift, you know, every two to three weeks. So uh, that's been our overall context here in America and how um, we have been trying to tackle this as a group of clinicians. So. Um, I'm Christian Bergman. Uh, I am at VCU Health in Richmond, Virginia, um, and I have no disclosures. So just quick context. I didn't put a slide up on the current numbers uh, since they change, but um, I'm sure you all are aware that the United States isn't doing so well in terms of uh, COVID-19. Uh, as of this morning, 26 million cases, um, 141,000 cases every single day in the United States is coming down a little bit if you look at the trends just like around the world. But uh, we have had 438,000 deaths um, and 2,800 deaths every single day. Uh, again, coming down a little bit from a high of about 3,300. In terms of nursing home residents, uh, we currently have had almost 550,000 um, nursing home residents who had contracted COVID-19. And of those, uh, we have had 120, 130,000 deaths. So um, important context here, and I'll talk a little bit about is uh, nursing homes in the United States. We are talking about Medicare and Medicaid facilities, right? So um, everybody has a different interpretation of what care home or nursing home is. We are specifically talking about long-term care residents and skilled nursing facilities, SNFs, and long-term cares. Um, so uh, of those population, and sorry, that does not include then all of your independent care homes, all of your small group homes, assisted living facilities, of which there's another 1.52 million uh, residents. So just so we're all on the same page here, this slide is from the, our MedPAC, which is our data book for nursing home. Uh, a little bit old, but it's a 
approximately about the same. So about 15,000 nursing homes uh, in the United States um, with about 1.3 million uh, residents. That counts short-term and long-term. If you were to add in our assisted living facility communities, um, you would be looking at about another million. So um, important context. Uh, just a, as far as you know, um, ownership structure, it does matter, and I'll get back to this, but um, majority, 65 to 69 percent of nursing homes here in the United States are for-profit nursing home chains, and that's important context to understand, so that's just statistics. Um, quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but people that look into the United States at nursing home regulations and so forth, um, you have to take into context the complex nature of these regulations, and um, everybody is probably aware of this, but very tightly regulated community, as I'm sure it is around the world, but um, here it is a federal system built up by CMS and then supported at the each state level, um, and these do not pertain to assisted living facilities, independent care homes, um, and other congregate settings. This is just Medicaid, Medicaid. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid certified beds. Just uh, touch briefly on this and I'll go into a few details here. Um, because everything that happens uh, at nursing homes is essentially guided by CMS, it's important to touch on three important key decisions that they made. Um, the March 13th memo uh, restricting visitors, uh, then we have the May 18th um, memo where they uh, began to outline a phased reopening uh, and then not included here is the September 17th memo uh, on redefining visitor guidance, specifically focusing on caregivers, uh, essential caregivers, and um, some better guidance. So. Uh, it's worth for this particular conversation to be familiar with these documents. And so just uh, from a context, uh, once CMS issues a formal memo, it then goes into um, what's called the guidance for surveyors. Um, so every state uh, then can use these memos when they go in and they uh, uh, look at individual nursing homes on a survey or an inspection. And so whatever CMS comes out with on a federal level is basically where it stands. You cannot cross the CMS here in the United States. Um, on a state level, it's a little bit different, but uh, once CMS decides something, this is basically the rule that you have to go by. And so it's challenging, uh, sometimes vague, but it's an important context to uh, understand in terms of how to make a difference at the local level. So um, this was the early one. I'm sure you all saw this. This was the March 13th uh, visitor restrictions. It's uh, basically following this almost overnight, you know, visitors were locked out of all nursing homes, all six, almost 16,000 nursing homes uh, and other congregate sittings uh, as a result of this. Um, the second uh, important one is the May 18th phased reopening, which uh, I'm sure you all remember back to the summer, there was a phase one, two, and three. And if your cases were going down, um, you could then begin to reopen, introduce outdoor visitations, indoor, and, and so forth. Well intended, took uh, almost two months for most nursing homes to start to develop a plan. So we really didn't get into it until about July. And that by then, unfortunately, we had uh, new cases and it was, uh, it's been a challenge. Um, then in September, CMS, um, multiple people over the summer petitioned CMS to try to ease some of these visitor restrictions to come up with a more logistical plan. And this is what we ended up with. And we were uh, happy to say that, you know, they did expand the definition of a essential caregiver, which was very helpful. They expanded of what, on what compassionate care visitations uh, meant. And they um, put a further plug in for something called the civil monetary penalty funds. Each state has a set of funds that can be used. And they said, well, you know, you should use those funds to uh, facilitate uh, visitation or visitors coming into your facility. And many facilities did uh, take people up on that. Um, and so 
Um, what about the states? You know, what actually happened in the states? And um, important here to understand just a couple of contexts here. This is not specific to nursing homes, but um, we are like 50 countries in one. So as you will see in response to, to COVID-19 throughout 2020, each state has come up with their own, you know, guidance, own um, reopening strategies for the communities in general. And, um, and so does not make it easy. The uh, challenges of coordinating a federal comprehensive plan in the midst of states essentially doing different things, some overriding federal, some having governor action items. And so this is just an example for reopening. Uh, subsequently for large gathering bans uh, has also been differences um, and face coverings as we all know. So it's important in the context of, of what's happening in nursing homes. So um, this is what it looks like essentially when you look at the United States and the uh, response to nursing homes, but more broadly, maybe COVID-19. So what to do? So um, in terms of pointing you all to a guidance document and say, you know, this is the best practice, as I uh, alluded to, it's become more important for us to make uh, inroads with some of the federal agencies. And so we have a number of groups that meet regularly with, um, representation from CDC, uh, as well as uh, HHS um, to provide some guidance, hopefully before they release them publicly, it's been very challenging. Um, what we are doing currently is we have about um, 50 or 60 long-term care clinicians that meet on a weekly basis. Uh, and most of us are engaged in some level of state uh, advocacy. Many of us sit on state governor task forces and uh, we sometimes get um, information across the country very quickly and we're able to kind of respond and uh, help point our um, state's guidance in a better direction perhaps. But I will say most people, um, if you go back, I didn't put the slide on, but since November, it's been very difficult here in the United States. I mean, we have had um, almost every single nursing facility in the country has had one or two outbreaks since right around Thanksgiving uh, in the United States, mid-November. And so if you look at this uh, guidance that was outlined in September 17th, you're not supposed to have any nursing home onset cases. Uh, you're not supposed to have be conducting any outbreak testing, but we have staff members. Our community prevalence rates are upwards of 20, 30 percent in some communities, and nearly impossible to to not have the virus enter care homes. So, while these are good steps, uh, we are trying to figure out how this can be modified, uh, perhaps in the setting of the vaccinations, and perhaps in uh, as this third wave comes down, there may be an opportunity to help ease up some of these restrictions. So. Um, we're working on that. And lastly, I will just say is that um, those care homes that have been associated with larger healthcare systems um, have traditionally done better. So if you're in a big hospital system that owns the SNF or has a close partnership, um, they have historically been able to do a little bit better, more access to resources, hospital epidemiologists, infection preventionists have been able to help guide some local policies. Um, and so um, that's been an important uh, network that needs to continue to be built uh, as we um, move on. Um, lastly, I'll just point people to this, the Coronavirus Commission safety that was uh, commissioned over September. While not much happened from it, I think the substance of the report is important lessons and uh, important uh, framework for the future. So if you haven't read it, I encourage it. And I think the National Academy of Sciences is uh, also doing a current uh, commission on nursing home safety. So um, important information. So. Thank you all for time. Appreciate it. Sorry for the technical hiccups. Thank you, Christian. Um, again, super interesting, I think, hearing what's happening in the States. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Catherine Hinsliff smith She's Associate Professor at De Montfort University in Leicester in the UK. She's also been doing some research in the impact of um, the visitor restrictions. Welcome, Catherine. 
very much, Lee Fay. And, and great to see so many co-authors to the paper, but also colleagues I know that are working re really hard on this. So let's see whether uh, technically I'm able to share my screen and that will make it a little bit easier. Okay, so can I just check first of all that all, you can all hear me, but also you can also see the slides. Okay, oh, that's a great start then. So yeah, so a very warm welcome. I know that we're all in different time zones uh, and I've got a, a short allocation of time. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry if we feel as if we're all whizzing through this, uh, particularly when we've been all around the, the globe or so it seems. Um, and what I want to do is just give you some perspectives um, about within the UK. I'm not going to uh, profess to know everything that's happening about everything that any every care home within the UK, but I want to share this from the perspective of um, uh, a, a, over a year ago now in January 2020, which who, who knew we'd be at this situation as where we are now. Um, obviously, we're aware that things were happening with, with regards to COVID and also my research work had been in care homes. Um, and so when we went into our first national lockdown on the 23rd of March 2020 in the UK, I identified that actually uh, what was happening for relatives that wanted to visit their relatives that were living in care homes. And from that, we've developed a UK wide um, family carer study. And that's where this a lot of this work has, has emanated from and also developing the links. And we've presented that work already uh, last July. But what I wanted to do for this presentation was just really look where we are at the moment in terms of visits to UK care homes uh, and perhaps then have the discussion in terms of what we're learning from other countries as we've already just heard but actually what what other things that we need to be taking forward as a group of academics so that that's my aim so really just to talk about obviously long-term care homes uh, and where we are within within the uk and as adelina rightly reports it's a changing picture so only an hour ago we had an update um in terms of where we are about uh, care homes and death rates and various other things uh, and just to give you a perspective there that in the uk and i'm sure this happens in in other countries, we have a daily bulletin which tells us uh, the current number of cases that are confirmed of having COVID, uh, the number of um, uh, deaths, um, uh, and also the number now of vaccinations. So you're probably all aware that we're actually in a vaccination um, uh, uh, stage here in the UK. And again, I just want to touch on that uh, because that will obviously potentially have impacts for our care homes. But again, this is, I think, where we'll come up for, for discussion and debate. So for those of you that are not familiar with the UK, um, most of you, are, I'm sure, are aware of what we're told by the National Health Service. So we do have a system here, one system, predominantly for, for health provision. Um, and we also have a large number of uh, care homes. Predominantly, I'm talking about in the context of those that are over 65 and will, for various reasons, um, be um, living in a full time in a care home. Um, and they can be long term residential care or they can have nursing attached to it. So about 450,000 people, roughly in the UK live in these types of institutions. Um, and that actually is a lot larger than our acute bed base within the UK. Uh, and that's important because when we come to look at the national lockdown and the, um, uh, the directives that were issued in terms of freeing up NHS spaces, it suddenly became apparent that actually where were these people going to go um, when we needed to uh, protect the NHS, which was a, a key buzzword uh, in the UK. So protect the NHS, make as many beds available as possible. Uh, and what was basically the directive in the UK was to release as many beds within our acute setting and the elderly and infirm were either returned back to their care home if they were already resided in one um, or they were um, um, discharged into care homes. At that point, there was no COVID testing. So I'll just leave that there for you. And then you can obviously, we, we can pick that up later in terms of that, the impact of that, that actually um, elderly people were uh, not tested. Um, uh, most people that live in care homes tend to be over the age of 80. They have cognitive impairment as well as sort of dementia, Alzheimer's and a range of multi comorbidities. And they will be a lot of them will be uh, what we call drug dependent in terms of the number of drugs that they will be um, administered. 
Um, the difference within the care home sector, I think, compared to perhaps some uh, your own perhaps uh, countries, is that they predominantly are privately owned now. And I know that my colleague has just given us an overview within the US, but this is um, uh, not where it's always been. It's been uh, funded predominantly by our local uh, authorities, uh, and it isn't funded by, directly by the National Health Service. And again, um, this is something that's really came to light for the fact is that suddenly people were aware that actually um, it isn't funded by the NHS. Who actually funds these facilities where are older people? And we knew that there was an issue with COVID uh, and those that had uh, underlying health issues were probably more prevalent to contract the disease and, and unfortunately then die as a result. So our care homes uh, tend to be funded in, in a, a various ways and various streams. And again, I don't want to take too much of this short presentation to talk about that. Happy to pick this up later on. Uh, but but um, the accommodation is provided by a range of different sources. It's not all NHS funded. In other words, it's not whole health provision. And so we have about 19,000 privately owned health, um, care homes within the UK. So in essence, each of those is an individual business. There may be a number of chains and each of them is responsible for their own uh, care home. So um, when I reviewed these uh, slides last week, I realized 30th of January is when we were talking about a public health emergency. So exactly uh, a year ago, when we were suddenly uh, aware that actually there was some sort of very serious virus, little were we to know as to where we are, are now. Um, and on the 23rd of March, the date I'd already mentioned, the UK went into a national lockdown. And, and the essence and the, the, uh, for that was to stay at home, to protect our NHS and to save lives. And we went into a national lockdown, which meant that we were restricted in terms of our movements. So uh, in terms of the context, what we're talking about today is we were no longer allowed to go and visit our relatives within a care home because we had to stay at home. We were allowed out for um, a period of time, once per day, uh, for a short period of time to take exercise. Um, and again, um, this uh, in effect meant that uh, visitors were no longer allowed to see their relatives. Uh, and that's how it was uh, to start with. I would bring us completely up to date in the sense that as of the 4th of January, we're now into our third lockdown within the UK. Not quite as restrictive as the one that we had on the, uh, last year, on the 23rd of March, but still within restrictions in terms of uh, where we may travel to um, uh, and within different areas. And we've had a range of things since last March but to now in terms of tiering, different aspects of the UK are put into different tiering, depending on the prevalence of the disease. Um, so again, people have, have had limited movements between different parts of, of the UK. Um, so as we're all aware, obviously, um, with the global pandemic, uh, the, the fight was on to try and find some uh, the vaccines, but also we were restricted from doing the normal things, everyday things that we're expecting. And to give you the perspective within the UK, um, it suddenly became apparent when we were reporting our death rates, that actually we weren't reporting death rates of those that were living in care homes. Initially, all our death rates were through um, those within a hospital setting. And it was really noticeable that suddenly our daily updates were talking about death rates from COVID, not included care homes. Um, and, and, and there was then pressure about, well, if the older people are also down, we're aware that older people within care homes are also contracting um, the virus and also unfortunately dying. And as I mentioned at the beginning, people were moved out of acute settings without being tested and going into care homes, only for us to find later on that actually they uh, did have COVID and subsequently a large number of those um, died. And I have got some, some uh, figures uh, just to show you. So in terms of where we are today, over 106,000 people, unfortunately, have lost their life uh, to COVID within the UK, which takes us, unfortunately, into the ranking of within the top five um, globally for the number of, of deaths. When I look back to the presentation that I did last year in July, reporting on the, the family carer study, we were talking about a death rate of 44,000. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm sure none of us would have imagined that we'd now be talking about that death rate within the UK. And that relates to people that have had a positive COVID test within the last 28 days. 
Of course, now we have got the vaccination. And in fact, only this morning, we, there's talks that we may have the fourth type of vaccination available. Um, and again, just short of 9 million people within the UK have now had uh, the first doses. Uh, and, include, and that includes uh, their priority areas. And within the UK, we've been prioritised into groupings. So the top four groupings are those elderly and infirm, those over 80, those living in a care home, uh, healthcare workers, and that also includes um, carers that are working within um, a care home. I just wanted to show you this. I'm not expecting you to, to read all of it, and I know we're going to share the slides afterwards. Uh, but this is actually on our own government uh, website and is widely available in terms of the requirements in terms of visiting. Um, and there has been a lot of pressure within the UK um, in terms of allowing um, family to visit their relatives. Um, and I'm going to include a couple of key things that are, are going on, uh, have, have been going on. What, what was highlighted very early on within um, uh, the pandemic last year within the UK was the importance of family visitors to relatives. And in fact, the fact is that actually relatives, even through our own study, relatives were not, um, would not often go just once or twice a year, Christmas and birthdays. They were regular visitors to a care home. They would go three or four times a week, perhaps. Um, they would stay for long periods of time. And this then became very much um, prominent when people were saying, this is affecting my father or my relatives' mental health because we don't get to see them. Um, and also, as, as my colleagues have already spoken about, the effects on the actual family caregivers um, that actually don't see themselves as being a, a visitor. And in fact, that has really uh, angered a, re a whole range of people that actually they're not visitors. They don't want to be classed as visitors. They actually want to be classed as, as key with the same as key worker status. Because while the care homes were closed, there were still visitors going on. So, for example, uh, other essential professionals were going into care homes to provide care. And family carers wanted to be classed in that same way. We're more than happy to be able to access tests, to have tests fully understood that obviously they'd need to wear the full PPE equipment, et cetera, and follow the care hub guidance. But this key worker status is something that is still uh, prominent and something that is still being pressed uh, with um, various uh, MPs and, and the government here in the UK. So you can see by this documentation, which actually was updated on the 12th of January, that it really talks positively about allowing visitors into, into care homes. And in fact, last year, uh, during what we, our summer period, which again, the weather is a, is a factor within the UK, um, care homes were slowly but surely opening up and allowing people to go visit their relatives. Um, and that tended to be um, garden visits. Uh, so following the guidance of, of care homes in terms of the distancing, but also window visits, which again, we, we've talked about previously. Um, and then as the weather started to change in the UK in October and September, there was still pressure to say, well, we're still not getting to see our relatives in the way that we'd like to see, because we're only being given allowance of, of one visitor per uh, relative, and that had to be a nominated person. So again, you can see that when you've got various family members that might regularly visit, they have to then choose. So there's a lot of controversy here in terms of how um, we allow visits, but also, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of our residents are, uh, are elderly, have dementia or cognitive impairment. And again, th th that confusion, and, and we have got uh, some uh, pieces of work that have been conducted here in the UK about that effect on residents in care homes, their own effect and how they might be deteriorating by not being able to see their relatives. So again, a lot of pressure around being able to get into see care homes. Um, and again, some of the key messages, uh, and this is uh, the latest guidance and, uh, um, about that actually it's the care homes themselves and the care home managers that need to think about what is best in practice. And the, again, this has caused quite a, um, a furore of, of, of social media in terms of, of, of tweets and pressure groups in saying, actually, should this not be a combination between the actual family? And in fact, that what it does talk about, that actually it should be a joint decision between family, um, from professionals, but also the care home managers, and working um, collaboratively together to think about what's best for the resident. 
Um, and again, I'll just mention that we have a pressure group here called Rights for Residents, which has got over close to 5,000 uh, members. And again, these are this is a group of, um, of people that are looking to put the uh, to, to to alter the policies in terms of allowing people to visit them, uh, to visit their relatives as a key worker, not just as a as a visitor because it's clear from um, work that's been conducted and in fact our own work that they're actually forming an, an essential and important part of care provision. So going in and doing daily tasks, helping to feed, providing social interaction, et cetera, are things that uh, relatives here in the UK, a lot of relatives feel that actually is a key uh, important aspect for their relatives' health and, and well-being. Um, so the picture at the moment is that the fact is that we're looking at vaccinations. Um, so here in the UK, I've mentioned the number of uh, vaccinations uh, that we now get daily updates in terms of uh, vaccinations. Uh, and the government has set out uh, their time frame of how many people and uh, by what time they want people to get uh, inoculated. And in fact, even today on the BBC and Sky News, uh, they're reporting that every care home resident in the UK, in England, has been offered a coronavirus uh, uh, um, a jab. Um, however, when uh, the report this morning, I'm sure Adelina was listening to this as I was this morning, um, that although um, they've been offered it, doesn't necessarily mean that they've all actually had it uh, taken it or indeed been uh, access to every care home because if there's an outbreak again they haven't been into that particular care home so it's not quite as clear a picture as we know he headline news might be um, and again they're talking now about milestones the fact is that actually uh, the intention is to get all care home residents to have the first of the two potential jabs. Uh, and again, there were there was issues in terms of healthcare staff. At the moment, we do have issues within our care homes that a lot of uh, Catherine, you're gonna have to wrap up. Yep, no, this is my last bit here anyway. Uh, so a lot of our carers are also um, isolated, but also uh, are, um, are, are tested positive. So again, that's putting additional pressures on our care homes within the UK in terms of the, uh, of the staffing, um, in terms of then allowing getting people to be able to visit, because again, it needs to be done safely with staff and there are resource implications for allowing that. So I'll just leave up my uh, last slide, which um, I know we've got time now to, to talk about questions and to discuss this. So thank you, Lee Fay, for organising. Thanks, Catherine. So I'm going to rapidly um, just present um, our um, recommendations very quickly, and then we'll take questions. So um, I put a link to our paper in the chat, um, but I'll put it, I'll drop it in again for people who arrived a bit later. Here's the paper um, and here are our recommendations. So uh, you can see that we are recommending that blanket visitor and family caregiver bans should not be used to prevent COVID-19 infections in care homes. Uh, the colleagues have already talked about the negative impacts of uh, the isolation on mood and behavior, deterioration of function, increased use of psychotropics. Um, we've heard about the impacts on family. Uh, the literature's showing fear, worry, and isolation. And we've heard lots of other kind of not in the literature, but data that's not published or in preparation that it's not a good, it's not good for families either. And we've also heard about the impact on staff. It's hard to, in the literature to pull out the differences, the, the impact, I guess, on the visitor policies uh, and COVID generally, but certainly doesn't, not having visitors makes it harder for staff. We're also recommending that um, facilities use safe on-site visiting practices and that, we, that those are chosen based on local levels of community transmission and in discussion with residents, family, staff, and health authorities. Um, we know from the Netherlands ex example and some data from uh, Hong Kong that uh, when community transmission levels are low and you use safe visiting practices, it doesn't lead to 
uh, increased COVID infections. I think there's less published data about what happens when there's high levels of community transmission. Um, our review of when care homes reopened was that there was really no consensus on what like a you know an appropriate or appropriately low community transmission was for safe visiting. So you can't say like when it's this number it'll be okay. You can now reopen safely. Um, we certainly know that there's some options which are safer visiting, such as some um, outdoor visiting, and um, we've seen these special facilities uh, with you know with barriers. Uh, for indoor visiting, we recommend that family visitors should be designated an, as essential partners in the residents care and those res those family carers may have, you know, more priv visiting privileges so they might be able to have more frequent visitors, longer hands on visitors if they can be supported safely to do so and that will mean use of PPE, they might be requ required to have um, more frequent tests, might be required to um, do more training. So we, we've certainly seen examples of you know, families going in regularly as visitors now. And this gorgeous, um, I guess, example of this married couple and when they reunited, you know, they're certainly essential visitor in, in my mind anyway, in beautiful photos. Um, we recognize that uh, safe visiting actually costs money for PPE, um, unless you require the families to produce it. In terms of supervision, in terms of cleaning and care homes should re receive additional government funding and support to implement safe visiting. If you want a special area, you know, you might need funding to, 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 to have the, the, the facility and then to support the staffing to do it. Um, Christian talked a bit about regulators. Um, I think that, or we think that regulators should be ensuring that care homes actually meet the residents' rights to have visitors. We heard some examples of care homes actually having much more restrictive visitor practices than the governments had suggested. And, you know, um, we think that regulators should be making sure that residents can have visitors unless the residents have, you know, said we don't, we'd, we'd prefer if we didn't um, for, for the safety of the facility. And also that regulators should make sure that safe visiting practices are being used. So thank you everyone um, for hanging on so long. and. We will go to questions. Um, and there's heaps of them in the chat. Let me scroll up. So uh, the question was about how some homes implemented more restrictive measures than required for local regulators. And so questions to the different speakers, I guess, in variations on how care homes have responded to pandemic. And who, want, who would like to have a go at this? This is Christian Bergman from the US. I'll just say that um, back to the ownership model for the nursing home chains, when you have uh, an operator that is in multiple states and across the country, they have sometimes had to enact corporate policies that are most restrictive and doesn't allow a lot of flexibility for individual preferences. And then the other um, part that we don't yet know is um, hasn't been well quantified is staff input. You know, if staff are stating uh, we don't want visitors, we're worried, then uh, that may influence the ownership. So, um, yeah. Just building on, on on Christian's points, you know, in Canada, we, we've seen is this this whole idea of what we call good policy, bad practice. So, you know, the government will say we have reopened, you know, long-term care homes. So when we put out our guidance originally in July, for example, Ontario, literally two days later in response, we sent them an advance copy, published some guidance, but then basically three months later in September, they published a new document that basically said, we realize that most of this guidance is actually not being implemented properly. People are finding reasons to say, you know, for example, some homes would say we're going above and beyond, you know, to try and protect the safety of residents by keeping visitors out, for example. And, 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 you know, and you could say, well, maybe they are, but, you know, many families disagreed. 
Um, and I think to Christian's point as well, um, in a number of jurisdictions, such as British Columbia, there's been a lot of um, complaints because the, you know, what the government said, we have a policy. Of course, we've always allowed essential family visitors or caregivers right from the beginning. But really, there's only about 15% of residents in all of British Columbia care homes uh, that, uh, and we're talking about 30,000 residents or so that actually have a designated family caregiver. So the seniors advocate for that province is saying, how can you tell me that 85% of them don't even have a single person registered who would come to visit them um, on a social way? So again, it's when things are left up to the individual homes to interpret policies, we've also found further uh, further challenges. And I think certainly some of those challenges, as Christian was mentioning, uh, do reflect ownership models and maybe philosophies of care as well. Uh, and if I could just add, I mean, one of the things that I think uh, was an oversight or something that became very prevalent within the UK is that the PPE was not delivered into our care homes within the UK. So that presented a, a real range of challenges. So whilst mm -hmm. care homes really did want to encourage people to carry on coming to see their relatives, there was no equipment sourced. And again, because we were privately owned, um, there was a whole dilemma about where to source it from. They were being charged extortionate prices to get it because they were late off the starting block because it was all used within the NHS. And, and, and what I would like to say though is that some care homes within the UK have shown absolutely fantastic best practice so it isn't all about you know the completely shut the door you know we have got evidence um a, a colleague of mine at nottingham is working with care homes some really good practice of how they have allowed visitors in and what they've done and how they've kept communication going as well it's just uh, i think what, what we're emphasizing here is that good practice isn't being shared out and why are they all not doing the good practice because there's been lots of all these other issues that have been presenting themselves so i just wanted to to, to say that in terms of hopefully answering some of that that, that the first question that was asked, Lee Faye. Hilda. Yeah, if I may add for the Netherlands, because when we did our second survey, like early October, when numbers went up to rise, we see that many people want it not a one size fits all. They want local adaptability so you can discuss with the residents, family, etc. But what you also see is that at a crisis, staff is at strain. And then usually these drastic measures are being taken out of fear of in infection, etc. without thinking, OK, but what does it mean and how is the quality? And we have also some examples in the Netherlands also of CEOs and leaders saying, okay, we're not going to do that. And this is how we uh, equip staff. And I think really the debate is about, okay, how can we support to have that dialogue together? Because also some family members are worried about infections, but the majority wants to come and wants to do, uh, take reason for that. But we also saw, because in the Netherlands, everything is governmentally funded in general, not everything, but in general, a lot of them. And we saw also the same things with the, with the equipment. Now that has been kind of sorted, but when you have in one area, nursing homes react differently and that causes tension with family. And there are family members who disagree and who stand up, sometimes even become aggressive. And then these incidents are taken as a restrictive measure for all. And I don't think that that's good. And we need to think of, okay, how can we support staff entering that dialogue with residents? Because what we also hear is that in some homes, uh, the dialogue with residents has just not continued and also client representatives think, okay, how do they feel and how can we see them? And I think that's really a hugely important point. Thank you. Um, there's a question I think to Hilda, were the, were the older persons and informal carers in the Netherlands roped in the decision to once again open the care homes to visitors? Yes, so and they still are involved, usually on the national level, uh, through the Alzheimer's Society, for example, and the patient uh, um, organizations, but also on a local level throughout the client representative councils. But again, what's interesting is that especially when the community transition is low, uh, the dialogue starts again, and we're thinking, okay, how can we prepare for the next wave? And now it is the next wave, and there's stress and crisis and lack of staff and lack of resources. And then it becomes difficult again and um, not the, the dialogue is not coming in yet on a national level it is so for example so now the Alzheimer's Society has also asked our government okay what do we do now so there are certain protocols again in 
plays and advices, etc. But not not a ban, not a national ban for visitors. And I think that's a good thing that there's no national ban. We can keep it open, and it's like a right to have visits. Um, yeah, during the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, question for Samir: Any progress on more than a visitor act in Canada? Yes, yeah, so I mentioned that in the um, I mentioned that in the in the chat box. So, so that uh, again, uh, because uh, uh, long term care, uh, if you will, is governed at a provincial and territorial level, we functionally have thirteen different systems um, that aren't necessarily in the U.S. For example, governed by you know um, CMS, uh, you know one federal authority that then has that translated. So in the province of Ontario, that's had this uh, that has the largest population, about a third of the of the country. That's where the opposition party um, uh, took our guidance, and uh, and the 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 main opposition party, the New Democrats, uh, put together an act called the More Than Just a Visitor Act, because that's been a very popular hashtag, if you will, on social media. Um, saying that, you know, don't call family caregivers visitors, call them essential, essential family caregivers. Uh, and it recognizes the fact that currently our long-term care act in Ontario, um, and I think many um, indicate that residents have the right to receive visitors. Um, they do have that right. It is actually in the law. So, you know, some of it's a bit of political pandering, let's be honest. Um, and scoring points uh, and poking the eye of, of, the, of the main government. Uh, but there's really nothing essentially wrong. But uh, you would also say there's nothing currently in the legislation that prevents or says that people shouldn't have access to visitors. Again, it's that idea of good policy, bad practice. So in classic fashion, uh, because this is an opposition-led um, opposition party led um, act. It did, I believe, pass first and second reading um, unanimously. Nobody voted against it, but then they carefully said we were going to defer this to a committee for further study. And of course, that could take forever um, a, a, as that happens. So again, it's a little bit of political theater, to be perfectly honest, because there really isn't anything that says that people shouldn't be allowed to have visitors um, or um, what in whatever shape or form. And there is technically no policy that actually bans that. Again, it's how that actually translates into practice. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, a question for Christian. Is CMS guidance equivalent to a federal law in the US? Uh, are family caregivers recognized with legal status? A short answer is no. Uh, there's different, you know, regulations are different from legislation. And so um, when it comes to specific definitions like that, um, you have to turn to the state regulations and laws. So um, it gets a little more complicated, but I'm not aware of a single state yet who has enacted um, an actual definition of an essential caregiver or a family caregiver. So uh, no, uh, it, it is not a legal status. Thank and just uh, one additional comment, just back to Samir's point um, about the, you know, this here in the United States, CMS also has a rule that says that all residents are entitled to have a, a visitor and certain rights. Uh, there's a bill of rights within the rules of participation. Um, the caveat was that CMS issued waivers uh, back in the, the spring that were, um, you know, temporary, but as long as the public health emergency by the federal government remains in effect, these waivers uh, override any of those previous rules. And so that's where we get into challenges with um, kind of reversal of some of the longstanding traditions that we have had, um, which make it more difficult for uh, advocates. Thanks. So there's some comments in the chat about resident voices and how we kind of ensure that resident voices are here, heard in this discussion and, and I guess in, pra in, in practice decisions. Who would like to have a go at that? I can, I can start. I think one of the key things has been um, is certainly, you know, trying to raise the voices of both residents and family caregivers. Uh, and one of the, the one of the neat things that was done recently was the uh, the seniors advocate for British Columbia. So not every province actually has a senior an office of the seniors advocate. I believe right now Newfoundland um, and uh, British Columbia and probably 
one or two other provinces at most have a role of an independent uh, office of the seniors advocate. And in British Columbia, where they've actually um, had quite restrictive visitor policies, and there's been a lot of criticism about them uh, overall, the seniors advocate has been very active there. Her name's Isabel McKenzie, and she published a report. I'll try and find it and put it into the um, in the chat box. But it was a survey that actually had 14,000 responses, and it was a survey that was put out to all um, care homes, you know, i.e., to residents and family care givers um, to indicate, you know, what they thought about the visitor, uh, current visitor guidance and guidelines. And you uh, probably everybody here knows what the answers were um, and was using that really in November as as a plea to say we need to improve uh, access to visitors uh, in response. Uh, I think the, the health minister said, well, 20% of residents have a registered visitor. Uh, and she said, well, I only have 15%. But regardless, like, how are you saying that's a good thing when 80% don't? Uh, so I'll find that, put that in. But I think it was just one clear way in which you could more formally try and engage resident voices um, uh, in, in one way or the other. Anyone else want to have a go at answering that question? Okay. Um, there's another tricky question, uh, which is if we say some residents need additional visits, how do we balance other residents' rights to remain safe? Yeah. Yeah, if I can reflect a bit on that, because I think that's the key issue, right? In nursing homes, there's the collective versus the individual perspective, and how do you outweigh that balance? And um, I think what we saw in the Netherlands sometimes that you say, okay, um, it's also the physical location of the nursing homes. How can you um, uh, maintain a visit without um, seeing other residents? For example, sometimes that is possible with separate entrances or separate spaces, etc. And I, I think just the dialogue is most important important because I remember um, some um, nursing home wards of, for example, 15 or 30 residents with dementia, you have to keep them in isolation. Persons with dementia are very difficult because they don't understand and they want to go out. So what do you do? Do you get the balance? Okay, they might get infected but versus keep the, the, the agitation, etc. in the isolation. So I think these are dilemmas, which the only way forward, I think, is to gain the dialogue. And again, that is very difficult in a time of crisis crisis, whereas there's a lack of staff, a lack of resources and staff of really high thinking, okay, with all these dilemmas and how can we support them? So we've done some dialogues also with teams and with managers and that staff also said we need much more, uh, for example, psychological assistance on dealing with all these dilemmas, moral issues, a debate and reflection on that, even in times where there is uh, uh, such a difficulty maybe also seeing how can we do it together because sometimes I think there's still like okay we've got the nursing home and the staff and they're not solely responsible right it's like within a community and nursing homes are part of the community so I think yeah we need ways and I don't have the answer because there's always the collective versus the individual but yeah we, we need to take that into account I think. Thank you. Um, Katharina Moore asked that question and she suggests that she maybe had tackled it you want to comment if you're still around? I can't see if she's still here. Sorry, I'm still here. Sorry. Yeah, we 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 trialed some visits with with family members who we felt their relative was perhaps significantly um, deteriorating because of a lack of contact, and those who had um, sensory loss, uh, we only provide dementia care. Uh, but it did feel like the dirty secret that we uh, were doing something perhaps we, we shouldn't because other residents weren't having the same privileges, as it were, or rights. Uh, but we just couldn't physically manage it for everybody at that time because our infection rates locally were teetering on uh, tier three and four, I think we were at that time. Um, but we have had to pull it back because obviously we're in a national lockdown now. But we've got our visiting pods but uh, it did feel wrong in some respects, but writing it was, it was quite a difficult scenario. Yeah, and, and I think building on that too, I think uh, you know part of that nuanced dialogue is kind of how do the staff feel about visits? How do the residents actually feel about visits? How the families feel about visits? And I think, you know, to, to Katharina's, you know, kind of, 
um, example about, you know, like we knew that this is the right thing to do for that unit, you know, that family and, and, uh, um, and, and their loved one, but we felt that we were violating potentially other resident rights or staff, we felt wrong. And it was interesting to see that where the entire resident and some provinces in, in, um, in Canada actually have what we call resident and family councils. So there, there's actually an input for residents to say what matters most to them, there's families. And again, it's not necessarily that you'll have unanimity, right? Though might be if what happens if all but one actually says, we don't want homes to reopen, how do you respect that? There's no law to say it's the majority rules or it has to be unanimous. But even in cases where residents and families are unanimous on what they want, sometimes we would hear that, well, the staff actually really want to keep the home closed because they're worried about their own safety, um, which is not an illegitimate concern. So, you know, often, you know, as is usually the case, it's about encouraging that level of dialogue. But, you know, in I think as, as you know, as been mentioned, you know, you have these rules that are put down and then these various ways to kind of uh, manipulate uh, their interpretation in various ways. But I think the homes that have been most successful, I think are the ones that really have had a huge amount of dialogue with the staff, the residents and that. Um, and we've certainly seen, I think a colleague, um, uh, I think um, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Hinslip Smith was mentioning how like in the UK, there are incredibly great examples um, and then there are others, you know, uh, from all spectrums and same in Canada, I'd say too, there have been homes that have operated as if you would never have known that there was a pandemic, not a single outbreak in downtown Toronto, um, continued with activities, everything physically distanced, absolutely creative, super great quality of care. Um, and it really just shows the importance of that on the ground, local, open dialogue and, and how that's been quite influential. Thank you. Um, we're going to wrap soon, but I want to take a, two question, a question on vaccines and insurance. And um, Katrina, Katrina asked about whether vaccines will change insurance practice. As we currently have no medical malpractice cover for residents and visitors who contract COVID-19, we only cover the staff. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I say maybe, maybe, you know, you never know, it depends. All right, um, I am going to wrap this up uh, in a minute. Uh, I, Adelina reminded me that she has a colleague, Josie Dixon from LSE, who's doing some work on visiting in care homes. Do you wanna talk about that briefly, Adelina? Uh, Josie's here, I think. Uh, let me see. Although I know she was about to be tested by, <laughs> from COVID. There she is. Hello. I actually, I'm actually about to go and do my, my ONS um, COVID test. So <laughs> I missed, was I introduced to something? Because I can stop for a second. Have you gone quiet? If you have a moment, just to quickly give a couple of words about your project. I know you will be joining us on a <laughs> webinar later, so, uh, or maybe, oh. yeah. <laughs> I'm tad, a tad breathless from running up the stairs. Um, yes, so we are funded. I work with Adelina at CPEC. Um, we're not directly with Adelina, but at CPEC. Um, and we're funded um, to, to um, conduct a project looking at care homes experiences of um, developing and implementing their visiting policies in the UK. Um, and I'm working with um, colleagues at CPEC, um, some of whom are on the call, uh, Clara Lorenz Dant and Sarah Russell, um, and Margaret Dangor and Daniel Casson and colleagues at Care England. So I am a bit breathless. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, we're, we're basically just looking at um, we, we, we're conducting a survey of 200, a qualitative survey of 200 care homes in England. So um, just, to, just to get an idea of the range and diversity of care homes experiences and what has influenced how they've developed their policies and how they've responded to government guidance. Um, because our perception is that there are enormous range of pressures on care homes. And I think we've touched on some of the sort of um, sort of moral dilemmas as well and the ethical dilemmas and the, the impossibility of kind of managing those. So we want to look at variation 
Um, we're going to follow up with some qualitative work um, with care homes and also with family carers. Um, so yes, and that's, um, we, it's quite fast track. We've got um, three stages to the research um, and it lasts for 15 months in total. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's what we're doing. And I hope um, I'll have contact with some of you as, as the study um, develops. Thank you. So that all right? um, thank you. Thank you for the time. And I'm so sorry, that was terrible timing. <laughs> I would like to firstly thank all my colleagues who have spoken today. And it's been, I guess, really fascinating to hear it in real life, um, the different, the, 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 the different policy responses kind of makes you realize that there isn't a necessarily right policy and that people were just making it up as they go along. And if we learn from each other, maybe we can make, make it up a bit better. Um, it's a terrible thing to say and to keep involving families and residents. I'd like to thank Adelina, of course, and LTC COVID for supporting this work and this webinar. And I look forward to, you know, ongoing um, publications from, from the group. That's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.